Welcome to the You Got Into Wear podcast. I'm your host, Joy Wade, author, college admissions coach, and founder of You Got Into Wear. Every Monday, I bring you actionable interviews with college admissions experts and students who share their insight on college applications, essays, scholarships, financial aid, test prep, and more to help you get admitted into your top choice universities. Let's get started. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the You Got Into Wear podcast. I am so excited that you are listening to today's episode. If you're a high school student who wants to learn the ins and outs of the college admissions process and eliminate the stress of learning everything on your own, you have to consider getting your free college admissions glossary guide from You Got Into Wear. The College Admissions Glossary is a downloadable PDF that provides over 50 college admissions and financial aid related terms and definitions for students. The college application process is overwhelming and the glossary will eliminate hours of research and confusion while filling out applications for admission, scholarships, and financial aid. You can download the free guide at glossary.yougotintoware.com. That's glossary.yougotintoware.com. Let's get straight into today's episode. I'm so delighted to welcome today's guest, Taylor Renault from Ivy Advice and the Yes Renault YouTube channel. On today's episode, we discuss Taylor's journey to getting into Harvard and rejected from Stanford, how to get straight A's in high school so you can get into the Ivy League, how to decide if the Ivy League is best for you, how to choose your high school extracurriculars, and mistakes to avoid when writing your college admissions essays. Taylor Renault is a 2016 graduate of Harvard University. She is also a YouTube personality who creates college-related videos for over 175,000 subscribers about her experience at Harvard. Currently, Taylor supports students in her online course called Ivy Advise, which coaches students through the college application process for Ivy League schools. Welcome to the show, Taylor. It's a pleasure to have you here. It's good to be here. Awesome. So to get started, I just want you to tell me a little bit about you. Where's your hometown and what type of student were you in high school? Okay, yeah. So um, I'm from Wisconsin initially, but I actually did high school in Ohio. Um, And (laughs) I was definitely, I wouldn't call me nerdy, but I definitely did all the things that a nerd would do in high school. So I was constantly studying You know, like any time I had free, I was studying and um, but I was also very sportsy and artistic. So I kind of got away with not being just uh, your stereotype. Awesome. So what types of extracurriculars were you involved in, if any, because I know you spent a lot of time studying. Let's see. So I did track all four years of high school. Um. I was running the 100 meter and 200 meter sprints along with the relay races. And then I also played tennis for three years and I did track for one. And I think outside of that, I didn't really have too many other extracurriculars. I did key club for a little bit. I did debate club, but basically just because my friends were in it and it was not as legit as debate club at other schools was. Oh, okay. And I noticed that you said you're involved in a lot of sports. A question I get all the time is, do you have to be in a sport to get into college? What is your opinion on that? No, absolutely not. Um, I think sports are just great to stay healthy, but um, obviously, so I created this online course, Ivy Advised, so I had to freshen up my knowledge a little bit. And what I learned, and also what I kind of understood going through the application process is that it's best to be just good at whatever you choose to do. So that doesn't have to be athletics. It could be music. It could be politics. Heck, it could be anything. But like, as long as you're super, super good in that area, you're going to have an advantage going into the college application process. Makes sense. I totally always tell students, it doesn't really matter what you're doing, just make sure you're passionate about it and that you are the best at it. Um, I have a question about your grades. You said that you wouldn't technically call yourself a nerd, but we all know that what that means. So what were your grades like and what is your advice for students 
for getting straight A's. I know that your most viewed video on YouTube is secrets to getting straight A's. So what are some of those secrets? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I guess I wasn't so much a nerd as I was competitive. Uh, so I actually went through high school with a perfect 4.0. And um, yeah, my my grades were always perfect. My test scores less so. But um, I guess the thing that always got me those grades was just I I wouldn't stop studying until I knew all the material front and back like somebody could test me on it and I could correct them on the way they asked me the question that's that's how well I knew the material before taking the test (laughs) yeah (laughs) and I would honestly suggest if anybody like if you want perfects in anything if you want to be spectacular at anything you do. I think everything's in the details. So knowing stuff exactly and refreshing it and refreshing it and refreshing it until you get to that point, I think that's so necessary if you want those grades or, you know, if you if you really want anything, I guess, in life. <laughs> Yeah, it totally makes sense. Definitely when a student's trying to get a 4.0, there has to be total commitment and a strive for excellence. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to transition into your application process. So where did you decide to apply and how did you choose where you wanted to apply? Oh, gosh. Um, so I applied to eight colleges and <laughs> a big part of me just wanted to get out to California because I'm like, I've been living in Ohio too long and there's so much snow. So I thought (laughs) anywhere in California would be awesome. So I applied to Berkeley. I applied to Stanford. I applied to USC. Um, But also because my parents had graduated from the University of Wisconsin, I applied there as well. And then I think I was actually applying to a lot of the Ivies just based on the fact that you know, I knew their names and I knew that they were prestigious. So I also applied to Harvard, Yale, and Columbia. And oh, I also applied to Brown. Yeah, I guess I just went for half the Ivies and hoped that something would stick. (laughs) Awesome. So did you have any other motivations besides getting out of the snow um, when choosing the specific schools? Were there any things that attracted you to all of those schools or were there anything similar between those schools? So, hmm. let's see. Actually, I know. So one thing guidance counselors always told us to do was that we should do a triangle of sorts to colleges that we apply to. So on the bottom level of that triangle would be like all your safety schools. You're supposed to apply to a lot of those. And then you're supposed to apply to fewer match schools and then only one or two dream schools. And I always remember hearing that and thinking, yo, that that advice is whack. Like, I don't know who came up with that. Like, if you want to get into a dream school, you need to apply to a lot of them, you know, because there's a good chance you're going to get rejected from a fair number of them. And so that's actually why I applied to five what I would call dream schools, um, the four Ivies and then Stanford, because I thought, you know, my chances are anywhere from what, 5% to 10%? Actually, I think it was like 5% to 15% at the time. And I thought my chances would go up immensely if I applied to more of them. That actually makes a lot of sense. If a student wants to go to a really competitive school and they have the grades, test scores, and that good profile, definitely apply to more than, you know, three reach schools because that's and your end goal ultimately, but definitely have some safety schools just in case, because right now those admission rates are extremely yeah. low. And sometimes it just seems like a chance. Do you think that Ivy League admissions are something that um, you can perfect? Or do you still do you think at this point it's really just a chance, even if you are a top student? I think you can perfect them to a point, right? Like, I don't think I don't think if Emma Watson applied to Harvard, Yale, whatever, that she would have been denied, right? Emma Watson applied to Brown, she <laughs> got in. I mean, there's a certain type of student, you know, if you've already made your mark in the world to a certain extent, you're the type of student that they're like ready to open their arms up and accept, right? Like 
another case in point is probably Malia Obama, right? She was going to get into whatever school she wanted to go to. Um, Now, most of us aren't Emma Watson's or Malia Obama's. And so our job becomes a lot harder when we aren't already standing out on a national stage, you know, so you can get pretty darn good, right? You can be top in your country in a music program. But I would say that only kind of increases your chances from maybe the five to 10% that it is in the normal pool to maybe about like a 30, 40%. So you're still working with a lot of uncertainty. Definitely makes sense. So if a student is trying to decide where they want to apply to college, Ivy or not, what types of tips do you have for them in the college search? And how do you help a student if their parents want them to go to a certain school, but they want to go somewhere else? I'm going to answer that one first. Um, Yeah. So first of all, like how much financially are your parents helping you with, you know, because if they're willing to pay the whole way, then you kind of have to, you know, work out a compromise between the two of you. Um, But if you're planning on paying for your whole education, then my opinion kind of is uh, you're the only one who has to live out every second of your life. So of course, take other people's opinions, but at the end of the day, choose to go to the school that you want to, right? (laughs) Because you're the one who has to do it. So I don't care if they're your parents, you know, like this is your first adult decision. Um, Now, as far as far as how to choose the schools, uh, I think you have to start by just first of all, making a list, you know, making a list of any of the colleges that you've heard in the past that are interesting to you and also going online and seeking out colleges that fit maybe with certain attributes that you would like in a school. And then once you've done that, you need to you need to really narrow it down. And you can do that a lot of ways. So um you can obviously do online research or you can go to the campuses, you can talk to people who have been there. One of my personal favorites is to go to the school run websites uh or not the school run websites, the student run websites because you can see what the students really think of a school. And when you're doing all this, you need to be considering certain things. So what professors do they have? Um, What courses do they have? How much will it cost? What are their extracurriculars like? Do they have housing all four years? You know, et cetera, et cetera. And I think the interesting thing is, is that you have so many different factors to look through but nobody can really tell you how to prioritize those factors, right? So you need to sit down and you need to do a little soul searching and figure out kind of what's most important to you. And once you figure that out, then you can really select for that. Awesome. That makes so much sense. And students, I want you guys to spend a lot of time when you're searching for colleges because you might find out that a school was not what you thought it was. And I feel like that happens a lot with the Ivy Leagues because there's so much hype around the name and students don't take the time to really get to know the school. How do you think a student can find out if an Ivy League school is the best fit for them? Hmm. Well, other than signing up for my court? No, (laughs) Um, let's see. Uh, So I think... I think one of the things students get wrong with Ivies is they don't think about how the atmosphere will really affect them. So the first thing I would say is think about what type of a place you want to be in, because some of these Ivy League schools are, you know, in the middle of New York City. And some of these Ivy League schools are in the middle of nowhere, you know, and so you just need to figure out, you know, what's your preference? Do you prefer living somewhere where there's so much activity or do you prefer living somewhere where there's so much calm? And I think that's a really good quick way to sort of start to um, sort between the Ivies because I, I don't think enough students give as much weight as they should to how your, your everyday culture really affects you. Um, And even diving more into that, not just the location, but also what you know of the personality of the students, right? I mean, what, 
Princetonians are known to be a little more preppy, and then Brown students are known to be a little more hippie. And I know these are more general overarching stereotypes, but it still kind of gives you a sense of what you'd be walking into once you step on campus. So when you were applying to these schools, what gave you the confidence? Was it your grades, your test scores, your overall application? What really just gave you confidence in knowing I'm going to get in somewhere and it's going to be a really good school? Hmm. Um, I guess I've just always had confidence. I don't know. I, I think I never had these like limitations placed on my mind the same way I think some other people do. I remember um, going into my guidance counselor's office and telling them what schools I was applying to and having them laugh at me. And I'm like, okay, screw you guys. Like my, my numbers were just as strong, right? So there was no reason to doubt myself. Um, I knew at least scores wise in all the ways that you could like quantify my success. I'm like, I have a shot, you know? And I strongly believe that you should go after all the things you want to in life. Like that one quote, uh, Wayne Gretzky, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. I I believe in taking the shot. And if somebody, like if you're going to get rejected, I want the other person to have to physically tell me no, because I'm never going to place that limitation on myself. I'm going to always make somebody else tell me I can't do something. <laughs> Sounds good. I love that you're just confident going in. You weren't letting your guidance counselors tell you where to apply, where you couldn't apply. I remember when I was applying to college, I grew up in a small town in Pennsylvania, and I wanted to go to USC in California. Mm-hmm. And everyone else, like 90% of the school, went to Penn State and a couple other local schools. And my guidance counselor was like, okay, let's see you do that. And I did. So that made me so happy yeah. when I left. That sounds so familiar. York, York Pennsylvania. <laughs> yeah. So let's transition into essays. I know that on ivyadvice.com, students can get a free download of one of your essays, but would you be able to give us a sneak peek about what you wrote your main essay about? And yeah, give us a little sneak peek of that. So yeah, actually the free download one was my supplement, um, which I think was actually my best essay. Uh, would you prefer me to talk about the supplement or talk about the um, Common App essay? Well, let's talk about the Common App one and the students can go grab the supplement at your website. Okay, so the Common App essay that I wrote was it was so funny. Um, it was about seashells. And so I basically wrote about this time when I was in South Carolina and I was just looking at the water and all of a sudden I saw it. It kind of like, you know, froze the moment and I was reminded to put everything in perspective, essentially. And I I talked about how all these things throughout my high school career were just like seashells to me, right? I would collect them, I would throw them away, I would collect them, throw them away. And at the end of the day, all that really mattered was that I was staying true to the things I wanted, you know, the things I was picking up and collecting and not just the things I thought I should have or the things I had told myself previously I should have. And the funny thing about that essay, gosh, nobody taught me how to write college essays, right? So I know sometimes when you're in high school, like it's it's hard to understand what these schools want. And that was kind of my case. I just thought, oh, I'll write another essay, you know? And so I I got started. I wrote this first paragraph that I thought was so beautiful, right? It was like the prettiest paragraph I had ever written. And then the rest of that essay was just, it was bad. It was just not worth reading. But because I loved that first paragraph so much, I just, um, I was like determined to make the seashell essay work. And I can actually tell you the sentence that made me <laughs> feel like I should stick with it. And that was uh, the first sentence. It went, it was the wrong time of the year for a beach to exist. 
right? It's so, <laughs> it's so, it's so stupid, right? There was nothing to it. But I think sometimes you just want to see something exist in this world. And I wanted to see that sentence exist so badly that I was willing to write this whole college essay around it, you know? And and at the end of the day, essentially, the essay said nothing about myself. It was not a good essay. I mean, I sent it to every single college on the Common App. And that's probably why I ended up getting rejected from half the schools I applied to on the Common App. Wow. So assuming that the supplement was a lot better, um, can you just give us maybe a one sentence summary and then students can go read the rest? Yeah, the supplement was awesome. The supplement was about how um, I'm a contradiction, but it all works out, right? So math and art, sports, older siblings, and somehow that all reconciles itself in this awesome beast of a human <laughs> at risk of sounding awesome. not so it's-, <laughs> <laughs> so it sounds like both of your essays, even though you claim that one wasn't as strong, it sounds like they both had a storyline. So how can you explain to students how to choose the right topic and how to kind of formulate that in a story and not just list off random things that you did in high school? I think there are two things that should always be in your essay, right? And the first thing is you should talk about either one, what you're really, really good at, right? Or you talk about an interesting story part of your life, right? And so if what you're really, really good at is, you know, track, then you talk about track. Um, If your interesting story is that you, I don't know, grew up in a family with two mothers, then you write about that. But that's essentially the first element. So you choose one of those. And then the second thing you want to have is like a narrative, right? So that's some kind of story that you can tell that you will eventually weave your interesting point or your interesting story into, right? So um, for example, track, maybe your interesting story is that one time you ran across the entire United States to raise money for a charity, Right. So that's an interesting story. And then you can weave your interesting point into that. Um, If that made sense, if that didn't, I could (laughs) re-explain. But I think it's the closest you can come to a formula, because really what admissions officers want to see is just how are you different and unique? And like, how does that make you brilliant? You know, and if you can do that with this like amazing narrative behind it, then it just helps stick in their brain so much better. I like that. I like that you're either going to shock them with an interesting story or just really impress them with something that you're talented at. I think that's a really great starting point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I wanted to talk a little bit about testing. So how important do you think that your SAT or ACT is when applying to the Ivy League? And did you perform well on these tests? Yeah, so um, <laughs> I think the ACT and SAT are like right up there with your normal scores from school, Um, a little bit below that, but just as important. And Actually, when you think about it, the admissions officers give a disproportionate amount of weight to the ACT and SAT compared to how long it takes you to study for them. So think if you want to raise your, um, I don't know, SAT point uh, score by like 50 points, you know, you could study for maybe like, well, actually, no, if you want to raise it by about like 200 points, you could study for maybe 50 hours, right? Whereas, you know, your whole... In school career, you spend like 5,000 in school hours, you know, trying to get a perfect 4.0. And yet they're kind of rated as like the same sort of more or less in the college application process. So like, why wouldn't you take the 50 hours to get an amazing score on the ACT SAT? Um, unfortunately, I did not know that before I took the ACT and SAT. Um I always just hated standardized tests. I didn't understand the reason for them. I thought they were lousy. I thought, why study for these tests? You know, life is the preparation. 
So I took these tests a couple of times and I would always study about two days before. And uh, because I had been preparing in class and stuff for just normal school, I got what a 32 on the ACT and a 2040 on the old SAT. Yeah. Awesome. Do you have any advice for students who need to improve their score by a lot and they might have to spend a little bit more time studying than um, a couple days before? Yeah. Take practice tests. Take all of them. <laughs> you know? Do all the practice tests. Um, because basically that's like the closest you can come to approximating what your actual score is going to be. And it's, you know, it's the least expensive way to try and get the best scores. Um, also, if you have the resources, I would say get SAT, ACT study books, get tutors, you know, but at the end of the day, what they're going to have you doing is just practice tests, you know, <laughs> just practice testing the crap out of things. Um, sometimes it helps to have them for strategy, but practice tests, I can't say it enough. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. A lot of students try to get around doing practice tests, but really that's the only way you can prepare for that because that's the exact example of the test you're going to be taking. Mm -hmm. And I did none of them. I, I wish I could go back <laughs> and redo it, guys. Trust me, this stuff works. <laughs> So on your YouTube channel, you talk about getting accepted to Harvard and denied to Stanford. Could you tell us about that experience? I know you also said earlier that you got denied into a few other schools. So tell us about that experience and how you kind of just stayed positive, even though you didn't get into everywhere that you applied. Yeah, so I remember that, actually. So I applied to Stanford um, early action. Um, and... Uh, so what happened was I got my rejection letter back in the mail. What did they give it to you? About mid-November. And I was devastated. You know, I was just so sad. But I was like, I was like Beyonce. I'm like, I'm not going to cry a tear over you. You know, <laughs> like, there's no way I'm crying. Like, you don't deserve my tears, Stanford. So, and I, I think it actually is a very emotional process for a lot of students because you spend 13 years in school like pounding out perfects just to be told no. And you're like, what, what was it all for? You know? Um, but I, I refused to cry. And I told my parents, I didn't want to be talked to. I went in our computer room uh, and I just, I pounded out my applications to the university of Wisconsin and to Harvard that day. And I sent them that day. Cause I thought, you know, why wait around just like, you know, in my own, pity. Um, I'm just going to try and make the next best scenario happen. Um, and secretly, I always kind of wanted to get into Harvard to have a story like rejected from Stanford, accepted to Harvard. It sounded, it sounds nice. It's, a it's, it's so much fun, you know, um, you experience <laughs> like incredible rejection and then incredible uh, acceptance. But I remember, so the first college acceptance I got was USC and Yay. that was yeah yeah awesome I was so excited it was in uh spring my senior year and I remember nobody was in the house with me I just ran around my house uh 20 20 times screaming I'm going to college I'm going to college because <laughs> <laughs> that's that's another thing I didn't apply to any college that I wouldn't have been happy going to you know so all of these colleges I would have been amped going to them and uh right yeah and then essentially the rejections from the Ivies just came one after the other it was like um waitlisted from Columbia rejected from Yale and I just thought you know what this this wasn't written in the stars for me and uh, I couldn't even get into the portal for Brown online, so I couldn't even see if they had accepted or rejected me. And then, wow, yeah, I, I just felt so dumb at that point too. I'm like, wow, no wonder they're rejecting me. I can't, I can't even get into the online portals. <laughs> um, and so it was a real conf like confidence hit. 
And uh, then I remember I told Harvard, I'm like, I don't want uh, like a message via email, right? I only want it via snail mail because I just thought like if they're going to reject me, they're going to do it in pen and ink. I'm not taking any of this like text message rejection, <laughs> you know? Um, and so what happened was that was actually the dumbest idea because I was traveling with my aunt in Mexico at this time because that's where she lives. And so we were uh, traveling and then I got this message from this woman, we'll just call her like Judy Barklin. And in the subject line, it said, congratulations. And I was like, Judy Barklin, Judy Barklin. I'm like, oh my God, that's the woman who gave me my Harvard interview. And I opened it up and apparently Harvard tells everybody else at the school before they tell you because she said, I just heard about it, just heard you got in, so excited. And I remember that was the first time like I went into the shower and I just cried tears of happiness and uh, it didn't stop for two weeks. And I, I've never been able to cry from being happy before, but that was, you know, the floodgates just opened. I was so excited. Awesome. Yeah. I remember when I got into USC, there is a video on my YouTube channel of me opening all of my applications and USC is the only one where I cried because I was in love with that school. Yeah. Like... <laughs> In the video of me getting into the other schools, there's, like, no reaction. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a beautiful school, too. Like, oh, my gosh. I checked out the campus, and you just feel like everything's gorgeous and, like, life's going to be amazing at USC. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It just has that, wow, everyone's enjoying their life here. Like, I got that vibe from it, and I was like, I want to be here because school's not always sunny. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But USC is, so that kind of helps. Yeah, no, definitely. So to transition, how did you ultimately decide to go to Harvard? Obviously, it's Harvard. Who wouldn't say yes? Mm -hmm. But what was the process of being like, okay, this is definitely where I want to be? Well, I think actually once I found out I got into Brown, uh, my first reaction was, oh, dang. Now I need to make a decision, you know, and I I thought about it and I honestly thought, you know, Taylor, if that's your instinct, you know, to cry for two weeks because of Harvard and to just be like, oh, dang, now I need to do some thinking when you get into Brown, like and not to say that Brown's not an amazing school. I would have loved to have gone there, but I think it just it really opened my eyes to just how much I wanted to go to Harvard. And it's interesting because I actually went to they have this thing called Visitas for all the pre-frosh or pre-freshmen to check out the school. And I went to that and before I had ever accepted. And, you know, I went around campus. I was talking to all these students and I was like, huh, I really don't fit in with these kids. <laughs> you know, like, huh, I really feel weird here. I'm like, but I'm going here, you know, because at the end of four years, nobody can take this degree away from me, you know. And so I think you're always weighing stuff because no place is going to be perfect. You know, the, no place is heaven. Um, I think people romanticize these schools and they want them to be the most amazing thing since sliced bread. And a lot of them are, but it's not, you know, it's never going to be perfect. <laughs> Exactly. So at Harvard, is there an abundance of scholarships or financial aid? I know a lot of students come up to me and they're like, hey, I got into this school, but I can't afford it. Or they don't even want to apply because they don't know if they can afford it. So yeah, at Harvard, it's all based on financial need. So there are no merit scholarships because if there were, like probably everybody would be going there, you know, on a full ride. Um, but so essentially, actually one fifth of students at Harvard college are going there completely free, right? So I can't remember the exact numbers, but for the Ivy leagues, it ranges from about, if your family makes 60,000 to $65,000 a year, then you don't have to pay anything to go to Harvard. And that includes your indirect costs. Right. So like travel, books, laundry, etc. Yeah. 
And, wow. Yeah. And I think <laughs> more than half of Harvard students um, have some form of financial aid. And of course, if you get any outside scholarships, you can always use them uh, at Harvard. Great. Let's talk a little bit about your experience at Harvard. What did you major in and how did you choose that major? Yeah, so I was an economics concentrator uh, with a secondary in French studies, um, so like the French language, and I chose economic. You know, it's funny. I really think when you like go into things, you're not always thinking for yourself. It's it's funny because I, I I think a lot of times people just expect, oh, you went to Harvard, you must be doing a lot of thinking. And you are, but I don't think sometimes you always step away from yourself to gain some perspective. And so people had always told me, oh, Taylor, you're so good at math. You're so smart. You should be an investment banker, you know? And I think that's like where people's minds go sometimes. Like what's prestigious and what's good for kids with math? And so I always thought, okay, I'll just, I'll do economics, you know? And actually, as I started doing it, I, I didn't actually love economics that much, but I got so far into it that I was like, well, you know, I take two, three more classes, I'm going to get my degree, you know? Um, and because Harvard has such a liberal arts education, I was actually taking a lot of different classes at the same time. So I took classes on U.S. constitutional law. I took classes on um, astronomy. I took classes on the U.S. education system, Shakespeare, Greek mythology. It was it was everywhere. And and so I got a really good lens, actually, from taking my economics classes to understand, you know, actually the more conservative side of things you know, I'm very liberal, right? And so to have somebody tell me why economically, actually, it makes sense why you might want to be more conservative. Um, it was a really good balance, I think. <laughs> yeah. And then French, I just took because I always wanted to learn something just for the pure beauty. And <laughs> I thought French was beautiful. And it actually ended up bringing me over here to Europe. I met my German boyfriend, and now it's helping me learn the German language. So it's amazing how things work sometimes. Yeah, for sure. Could you tell me a little bit about the student life at Harvard and what types of vibes it gives off? Oh, man, yeah, it was crazy. I always like to say it was a mix of some of the smartest people in the world mixed with some of the most well-connected people in the world and you just throw them together and <laughs> watch what happens. And so a lot of times it was really interesting because the social scene would be split with people who were in final clubs, you know, came from old money, you know, their families were economists or CEOs of things. And then uh, the other half of students were like, partying? I don't I don't like to do that. I like to stay in my room on Saturday night and finish up my problem sets. And so it was it was so interesting because I liked having both of them there because in some ways I felt like as just a midwesterner, you know, I I felt sometimes I felt a little more normal, <laughs> you know, I felt like they threw us in to help balance out some of the extremes. And I felt like I could walk between the two groups pretty easily and always took very interesting lessons from both of them. For example, one of my friends, her mother was Vera Wang, right? And I always thought, how amazing is that? Like your mother is a famous wedding dress designer. You know, like, what do you grow up thinking is possible if you grow up in a family like that? You know, like you probably have this idea that anything you want to make come true, you can make come true. And then, you know, <laughs> at dinner, I would have conversation with, you know, quote, unquote, some of my nerdiest friends. Um, and we would just have conversations about Kant and different philosophers over the dinner table. And it was this incredible mix that I I never got in high school, like conversations didn't go that deep you know, possibilities didn't stretch that far. So it's just, man, it was a cool time. It was an interesting time, a trying time, but I would never take it back. 
Also, sorry, I feel like I'm monologuing right now. This is the curse of being a YouTuber. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is all great because I feel like a lot of students don't really get to know what it's really like from another student's perspective. Are there any stereotypes that you would like to debunk or affirm while you have the microphone? Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Just like the main one that all of us Harvard students like have to do something because of um the degree we get. Now, I think it is our responsibility to give back to the world, but I think the way in which we do it, um, I don't think anybody else should have a say in, you know? Um, I think that needs to come from us and what we find special because one thing I've noticed on my YouTube channel, you know, being a Harvard student, is that a lot of people will knock me, right? They'll say, you know, you're a Harvard student. You could have been a financial analyst. You didn't have to do YouTube like like people without Harvard degrees do YouTube. And sometimes it's hard to explain that all of us students are different, right? And and there is no one type of Harvard student. I mean, there's no one type of Ivy student. There's no one type of college student, right? And so I think the thing that people need to know is that you don't just need to do these like stereotypical jobs when you get out in order to be successful. And you're doing YouTube full time now? Yeah, so I'm doing YouTube part time and I'm also creating uh, side ventures <laughs> on the side. So Ivy Advise is uh, one of my little entrepreneurial pursuits and I keep doing those things alongside the channel. Perfect. So everyone, you don't have to take that traditional route. Just keep your eyes open. Anything that you're interested in is always a possibility. Because mm -hmm. I, I wanted to take the time. Oh, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say it because I, I, I think a lot of students do get in those mindsets, especially lots of students at the Ivies. Um, I've seen a lot of my really good friends get roped into consulting or investment banking because it is seen as prestigious to the outside world. And I think that's totally fine if that's what you want to do. But I think sometimes a lot of people do it because they don't know what else to do. <laughs> you know, so I just, even at what you would consider to be the high levels of thinking, I think there's still a lot of self-doubt. And so I would always say, yeah, keep your eyes open. Look at what you want and don't let other people's opinions shape where you want to go. Perfect. What would you say the transition was like academically from high school going into Harvard? Hmm. Um, it definitely stopped being as much of a like rinse, wash, repeat, you know, so I couldn't just study things, you know, verbatim, memorize them and spit them out on a test. I had to do a lot more of like thinking like what would happen if this and this go together? Or, you know, how do I get my friend to help me out on this, like, homework set? And so a lot of real life skills. Um, and, uh, so it, it was just interesting. Um, yeah, so you had that. You had a lot more thinking. And I think also things just come at you so fast. I think it was a slower pace in high school. I remember my first week of Harvard I was so behind because I didn't understand you were already supposed to buy all the books off the syllabus. I was like two weeks late my freshman year already because I just didn't understand how the process worked. And I think they they give you a lot more freedom. It's interesting because I think college is still very contained, but within that contained bubble, you you have a lot more freedoms than in high school. And so you need to be responsible with those For sure. So we're about to wrap up soon. I wanted to talk about some resources and where students should be looking to, you know, learn more about college, learn more about where to get scholarships. Do you have any resources that you would point students to if they are just getting started with the college process? Google.com. <laughs> um. <laughs> You know, uh, Prep Scholar is a good one. It's actually by a fellow uh, Harvard alum. And, 
yeah, I I always like reading his stuff, but I think I honestly I'm just gonna say this. I think the best way to know about a college other than just like searching it is to see what the students have to say about it. And actually a lot more nowadays than what was happening back when I was thinking about college is these college students are making YouTube videos. And so you can actually go to those and see everybody just, you know, spill the tea on what it's like to be in that school. For sure. I always say go to YouTube. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And I wish, I wish people had been doing it when I, you know, was in high school looking to college. I mean, that's, that's honestly why I started my channel. Yeah, that's why I started talking about college on my channel. There's so many YouTubers at USC that do videos. I watched your videos when I was oh. applying to college. Oh, um, baby. So, yeah, I YouTube was my Bible for learning about college. <laughs> that is, it's so funny too, because I think a lot of Oh my gosh. I think a lot of people, especially four years ago, when people didn't understand how big YouTube actually was, you know, um, like it was a thing, but it wasn't as big as it is now. Um, it, it was seen as like a weird thing to do at Harvard. Like I know. Yeah. <laughs> like people just didn't do it. <laughs> yeah. I can totally relate. I was there at Harvard, but I was still in high school. I started my channel like five years ago and people were like, what are you doing? Yep, you know, too. <laughs> it's so real. Like, like I think it was like the second wave. Like we didn't start as early as the people in what, 2006, 2007, but early enough yeah. so you could see what they did and you're like, ah, this is cool. But then too early <laughs> that not everybody was like, oh, this is cool. <laughs> yeah. So to close, I wanted to give you a chance to kind of talk about your online course that teaches students how to get into the Ivy League. So I'm going to give you a chance to tell our audience about that. Oh, yeah. So it's essentially it's a 48 video uh, video course that essentially helps students figure out how to increase their odds of acceptance to these Ivy League schools. So, you know, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Columbia, Dartmouth, Brown, UPenn you know, so on and so forth. Um, and so it's, it's videos also accompanied by PDFs that are made to help guide the student uh, through this process. And it's actually so cool because, so I created it with my boyfriend who has been uh, head of consulting here at um, an innovation firm in Munich for the last three years. And he's just brilliant, right? So he helped me lay it all out in a structure that really actually helps the student understand and isn't just me being like, oh, yeah, this is also a thing I remember. Oh, yeah, this too. It's like, no, this is structured and legit. And I honestly, I I wish I would have known all of this stuff when I was applying. And I think I figured it out as I was applying and afterward. But I guarantee if I had followed my advice now, back then, um, I would have gotten into more IVs than I did. I'm just 100% sure of that. And what is the website for students to get their hands on the course? Oh, yeah. So if students want to get the course, it's called IVAdvise.com. So I-V-Y-A-D-V-I-S-E dot com. Um, Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> awesome easy peasy and oh yeah perfect and where yeah. else can students get in touch with you your youtube channel social all of that good stuff yeah so um obviously if you have any questions about the course you can always reach me at contact at ivyadvise.com but if you want to just know what's going on in my crazy life uh they can obviously go to my youtube channel yes or no so Y-E-S-R-E-N-E-A-U. Um, Instagram, also at the same handle. And man, that's where I just share all my wildest thoughts. And I'm actually going on, what, a two-month U.S. road trip across the state. So they'll be able to follow all of that there. 
Awesome. Thanks so much for sharing these awesome resources and sharing your journey to Harvard. I will definitely list all the links you shared in the show notes. Um, That is all the time we have for today. Thank you for being an amazing podcast guest today. Yeah, absolutely. Hopefully I didn't go too Hamlet on you and get too monologue but I really, really enjoyed it. So thank you. Awesome. Goodbye, everyone. Bye. Thank you so much for tuning into today's episode. If you found value in this podcast, make sure you share it with a friend and leave a review because reviews will help this podcast be discovered by other students and families that are looking to get into college. If you're interested in finding the show notes with links and free resources, go to yougotintoware.com slash podcast.